Welcome to season two of The Ruddle Show. I'm Lizette and this is my dad, Cliff Ruddle. And we hope to even give you a better season than last season. We've been practicing a lot and hopefully we're getting better. I was hired on again, so that's encouraging for me. <laughs> I retain my position, barely. <laughs> We thought it would be good for the first show of our second season to start off with a book recommendation. And, it, and we'll do this every now and then, not a lot of the time, so you don't have to be reading all the time. But um, we just picked a book that we both really like. We both have not even read it recently. It's just a book we read a while ago, but it's always stuck with us and it's come up in conversations a lot. And, is, and here's the book, it's called into Thin Air, and it's by John Krakauer. Maybe some of you have heard of it. And um, just to give you just a really brief um, description of it, this author, John Krakauer, worked for Outside Magazine, and he was hired um, by them, or commissioned by them to go into Summit Everest, to join an expedition in Summit Everest. And the main point of his um, article or book or whatever he was going to write was he was going to talk about the growing commercial, commercialism on the mountain. Mm -hmm. Then while he was up there, they had their worst disaster in May of 1996 that they had ever had. And a lot of people died. A storm came in unexpectedly. Um, this is interesting that we're doing this now because when our show, this show airs, it's going to be April or May. So that's like the time of the year, the only time of the year that you can actually summit Everest where the weather's good enough. So we all saw those lines last year. Did you see those pictures of those lines? Wow. Yeah, I was thinking that since this will air about the only window you can climb Mount Everest, that many of our dental friends out there that are prolific climbers, uh, they might get excited about this book and be better prepared when they make their assault themselves, <laughs> right? And climbing Mount Everest is not so different than being an endodontist because if you think about it, you're going to a place where very few people have been before, whether it be the summit of a mountain or inside the canal of a tooth that's never had endodontics before. <laughs> um, you need the latest technology. You need a lot of training. So, you know, there, there's some similarities there. I mean, who would not want to read this book? Well, you know, one thing that I liked about the book is uh, some months ago, Lisa showed me uh, a picture on her iPhone, and it was like all these people that were uh, ready to make the final assault from, I think, Camp 4 to the top, which, how long did that take? It was a short distance, but it was an enormous amount of I think from the effort. highest base camp, you have about 24 hours of oxygen to get up and back, like, or maybe it's even less, maybe it's 12 hours, but you don't, you can't stay at the top. So you have to start from below the top, go up and back and get back there by a certain time window before that's, you run out of that's oxygen. That's exactly right. Uh, because uh, if you've watched any climbing in your life, every step at the top is like laborsome. It's like uh, walking becomes uh, almost crippling. So what I thought about though, when I saw all these people in a queue, I started thinking about the politics of the mountain and I started thinking, well, why are so many permits issued? And the other thing that was startling is it used to be climbers that got Sherpas and did these assaults and really quite good climbers. Oftentimes they'd done some of the other great peaks on the earth. So then I started realizing some of these people were out of shape, they weren't in condition, but they had the money so they could buy the Sherpa and, and, and sometimes two Sherpas to help carry all their gear so that they could say they summited. And I thought that was, um, there's, you, know, you know, there's different, there's some expedition, and the politics is around this, some expedition groups, they require that you've already climbed an, another 8,000 meter peak, that you're an experienced climber. There's others that will take on near beginners because they basically think the Sherpas are going to, you know, just um, chauffeur you up to the mountaintop and back and carry all of your things. So, yeah, I think that the people who are experienced are concerned that the beginners are going to, you know, hold them up and, and put other groups in danger. So, I mean, I guess that's similar to like a, a general dentist that might get all inspired with the latest technology and hoping that that's going to work for them and maybe doesn't have the training or, or what, like, Yeah, can they can better, surround maybe? themselves with all the technology, but if we don't have the training, we're a little short on experience because that's earned. Uh, we can get into very tricky situations very, very quickly. Just like 
uh, the last window from Camp 4 to the summit uh, was not to be started after 2 p.m. That was it. So if you weren't on your way to the summit by 2 p.m., finished. Well, there were guys in Camp 4 that took off at 4 p.m. Well, I think it's like you start in the middle of the night and then you have to leave the mountaintop by 2 p.m. Mm -hmm. So you like if you're it's if it's 2 p.m. and you're just 100 meters away, you should turn back and right. not and not finish. <laughs> so I was surprised because uh, discipline broke down and uh, risks were taken and groups split up and people uh, got separated. And I started thinking as an endodontist, a lot of these kinds of things with much less gravity happen to clinicians every day in the big city. Yeah, like maybe you have enough training and enough experience to, to do the case if everything goes super smoothly. But maybe if something happens that is unexpected, then maybe all of a sudden you're like way in over your head. And I think that's kind of what happened on the mountain. You know, a storm came in and a lot of people were way in over their head. But you know what? It's a great adventure story. If you like hiking and we love hiking, we've gone on many hikes. And I do think that, you know, just getting out into nature and breathing the air and hiking where there's not a lot of people around can inspire you when you get back to work. Yeah, we had a show last time, last season, in the last show of the season, stress management. Right. And one of the things we learned in stress management is change your perspective, change your context. Change so your environment. We went up Mount Talek. That was almost 10,000 feet. That changed our perspective and it changed our environment and it made for a lot of great memories. Well, so this is our recommendation. And also, if you're an endodontist or a dentist out there and you've actually summited Mount Everest, we'd actually be interested in hearing your story. So get in touch with us because this is a very interesting, the mystique of Everest is just really something that we are just always talking about and it's just really interesting to us. So we're going to start our show now. And today we're going to talk about wave one and the concepts behind it, how it all got started. And then um, my dad's going to show you how to use the file system. So here we go. single file shaping system came to market in 2011 and has quickly become the file of choice for many clinicians, dental schools, and endodontic residents, largely due to its simplicity and predictability. Today we're going to talk about the Wave 1 system, the concepts behind it, and then my dad is going to show you how to shape a canal using the Wave 1 technique. For those of you who are using Wave 1, you might pick up some tips that you weren't thinking about or, or weren't aware of. And for those of you who don't use it, you'll appreciate its simplicity and you may want to try it out. But first, you're a co-inventor of the project, of the Wave 1 system, and there were others that worked with you. So why don't you tell us more about who were the people involved and a little bit more about the whole idea behind the Wave 1 gold single file shaping system. <laughs> I'll be happy to. It was kind of a, a messy start because there was usually projects or three or four people, but this was eight people. Uh, I'll explain briefly. So Pierre Machtou, Professor Machtou, which many people know internationally, uh, very, very smart guy, uh, been doing quality endodontics for decades, and you stayed in his apartment in Paris, you might recall, for probably more than a year when you were taking language. But that Pierre Marsh too. Anyway, Pierre Marsh too had a very interesting idea of using unequal bi-directional angles. No momentum happened. Uh, the company, Dense by Serrano at this time it's called, wasn't really interested. So I want to bring in Ben Johnson because Ben Johnson, which many of you know internationally, we could probably call him the father of NITI, uh, he on our behalf went to corporate and convinced corporate over many, many years that it was a worthy project and there was a, a market for it. So 
Ben asked me to choose the team, so I chose. We had Ben, Pierre, Cliff, John West, Julian Weber, Sergio Cutler, Willie or Wilhelm Perto, and finally Gasania Red. So there was eight people. But uh, after about one year, uh, VDW wanted Gasania Red. He went that way, and uh, some other guys went on to other projects. But we could probably look right now and see uh, the four principals. So here we are at the factory in the foot of the Alps, just in a little village called Belague. And uh, you can see Willie Perto here on the left in the Levi's, uh, Sergio from Florida, Willie's from Paris, and the little guy, the third guy from the left is, uh, I think he's staying on a box, but his name is Julian Weber, really good guy. Mm -hmm. And then I'm with my team. And then there was a new factory part of the plant built, so we had hard hats and had some fun. And uh, Willie must have stepped out, probably bad behavior. But anyway, the three of us then were able to get our thoughts on paper. And with the engineers, the project really did commence. And of course, we were looking to do something that would be superbly safe and incredibly efficient and super simple. OK, well, why don't you tell us a little bit more about the system and the concepts behind it? OK. <laughs> Okay, let's look at wave one a little bit deeper. You need a dedicated motor. You might have one already. If you don't, the XSmart Plus is really a good one. The IQ will allow you to get your own instrument sequences and it's got a touchpad. It's Bluetooth to your handpiece so they can talk to each other and you can do amazing things. You might want to look into that a little bit more. Regarding the four instruments, we have a primary instrument that is usually the first one that you would select and use. It is oftentimes the only one you will use. Oftentimes means about 85% of the time if you're a general dentist, that will do about 85% of all teeth and canals that visit your office. You have a smaller instrument, a 2007, if this one's too big and can't proceed easily in advance to length. If you uh, discover that your foramen in a younger patient, maybe a maxillary anterior is bigger than a 25, we have other sizes and tapers to handle that. Understand most importantly that the seven, six and 5% taper is confined just to the last one third of the instrument. And that's important because a fixed taper is what allows us to irrigate safely and to fill root canal systems. So if we go then to how we decide to make a file, well, when you look at the literature, you go back and look at maybe 60, 70 years of uh, papers, you look at maybe their bibliographies, and that might take you back to a thousand peer-reviewed papers. And at some point, the edges of the truth begins to show up. And what Jim Wallace and his guys discovered, that if you had a 40 at length, it's pretty big, but that was in that era, with a 6% taper, you could clean. You could get your irrigants down there. You could affect warm gutta percha in the apical capture zone. Baumgartner had a whole different idea. He said, let's emphasize keeping the frame in a lot smaller. That's 100% smaller than 40. But he said, let's emphasize deep shape, more taper. And what he showed is you could get irrigants down and there was no difference statistically in cleanliness between these two shapes. So 20 is a lot smaller. It'll go and snake through microanatomy more safely, uh, less ledges and blocks, transportations and rips. So somewhere in between these numbers is where file builders should be thinking. So if you look at our Wave 1 Gold instruments, they're all falling in between these parameters. Well, so how do you get from a virgin pulp that needs to be removed for whatever reason, and how do you get to a fully shaped canal with one instrument? It has to do with design, metallurgy, and movement. We'll take a look at that. So here's our primary file, 2507, and we can basically catheterize this with a hand file. And then we have a pilot hole, a glide path for this tip that's flexible to snake through and follow passively and carve out a final shape that can be cleaned and filled. Let's look at some of those design features. Per usual, uh, the diameter, that means the diameter at any given cross section, 3, 6, 9, 12, so we have a active portion and our file is progressively decreasing percentage tapers like I mentioned earlier. 
our fixed zone is only in the apical one third. Now, this is interesting because by decreasing the tapers, you decrease the cross section diameter. And it's important to note that about nine millimeters up and 12 millimeters were 85 hundredths and one millimeter. Hey, half the orifices that you encounter, so you cut your access, now you're looking at an orifice, half the orifices in the human mouth are over one millimeter. So we already have a conservative instrument. If you divide your radicular portion of the root into thirds, coronal one third, middle one third, apical one third, then you can see three, 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 you're nine millimeters at the orifice. And if you're four millimeters, four, 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 you're at 12 millimeters. So we have a file that's gonna maximize remaining dentin. And that's one of the concepts of minimally invasive endodontics. Also, we notice that fricated teeth oftentimes have furcal side concavities, so we have to be very careful that we don't have preparations that begin to drift as we shape and as we shape and as we shape. We don't want our preparations to drift into the furcation area because that then will weaken roots and predispose them to longitudinal fracture, if not an overt fracture or strip perf. So, we have a pretty good design. Uh, there's another design that's very interesting, I think you'll all like. Um, maybe this is a little bit technical, but we use the concept of alternating offset machining. So if you look at the file and you go up the file millimeter by millimeter by millimeter, what you'll notice in offset machining, you will have two points of contact. You go up one millimeter, you'll have one point, two, one, so look at the file and what you'll notice is we have tremendous chip space. We have chip space and only one point is in contact. And when we have two to keep the file centered in the root, you can see we have space here and we have space here, but there's a lot of space for hauling debris up and out of the canal. Okay, well, I know that the file underwent some changes in 2014. So I, I know the parallel par parallelogram shaped cross section that we just saw was one of the changes. I'm assuming um, this gold metallurgy that I'm seeing behind you is another thing. Thank you. Maybe to, to be a little better teacher, uh, we have an 85 degree parallelogram, and that is a uh, proprietary cross section. And that has to do with this chip space. The alternating offset machining gives us more chip space and more ability to auger coronally. So you're right, we've talked about that. And then we talked a little bit about uh, uh, the, the metallurgy now needs to be discussed to per your, it's all three, it's the, the design, the metallurgy, and the movement that together are synergistic. So very good. Were there always four files in the system or was it one added? Oh, well compared to the original wave one, that was a convex triangular cross section. So we went to the parallelogram that's very good. And then we had three files in the old days, and now we have four files, so we could do a little bit more of the anatomy that presents in our offices on a daily basis. Okay. Yeah, very good. So uh, if you have questions out there too, be sure to ask them, it's fine. So back to metallurgy, it's a post-machining event. So the files are machined, the handles are put on, they're put in cassettes, thousands at a time, they're put into ovens, they go up to a proprietary temperature, and then they're allowed to cool down at room temperature, and they get an oxide that's gold color, hence gold. And this improves compared to wave one gold. Go to wave one gold, compared to its precursor. These are engineering reports, we got 80% more flexible. If you are still using original wave one, you will be massively impressed how flexible this metallurgy has allowed these instruments to snake through multiplanar curvature. Not so bad, not so bad. 50% greater resistance to cyclic fatigue. I mentioned in other shows that a file could be considered to be like a man's suit coat. So when you bend the file into a curvature, you have compressive stresses. And on the outside of the curve, you have tensile stresses, pulling stresses. So when you're going around a curve, reciprocating or rotating is like taking a paper clip until failure. So you can see we've massively uh, allowed these instruments to work in curvatures and have a safer experience. And of course, not so bad. 
not so bad to reduce your shaping time by 23%. That's staggering. That's staggering if you're talking efficiency. So you had mentioned, I, I see now it's coming up, that the movement for wave one, that it uses reciprocation versus continuous rotation. So how does that differ from reciprocating files of the past? And what are the advantages of reciprocation versus continuous rotation? Very good. Um, you know, reciprocation isn't new. Blanc, the French dentist in the late 50s, introduced uh, a reciprocation angle. It was big angles, 90 degrees clockwise, 90 degrees counterclockwise, 90, 90, 90, 90. And then I'll skip, but through the decades, then three more companies came in. Uh, Essential Dental Systems out of Manhattan, uh, uh, Cybron Endocur, they did a, a reciprocation, and finally Ultradent, uh, Ultradent in Utah. And they did 30, 30, 30, 30. But what was important is the angles were always equal. Well, what happened, and this is a great question because nobody ever asked this, why didn't equal angles take over? It's because as a file goes clockwise, it's pulled in. But when it goes counterclockwise, it's pushed back. So the colleague has to press inward firmly to make the file advance. The problem is a lot of debris was collecting and getting pushed apical to the file, which caused block canals, increased torque, and increased cyclic fatigue, and we had broken instruments. So Mosh 2's idea was to have unequal bidirectional angles, and I think we can look at that right now. So this is the whole key to wave one or wave one goal. If you look carefully at the movement, we're going to make an engaging angle that's 150 degrees. And incidentally, that 150 degrees has been calculated to be just beneath the elastic limit of the file. So we are never over engaging. Then the disengaging angle is 30. So what happens if you think about 30 from 150, the net is 120. So after three cutting cycles, the file will have moved one circle or 360 degrees. That means we are effectively augering debris up and away from length, up into the looser part of the canal, into the pulp chamber where the debris can be cycled off. So that's pretty much the story with design. <laughs> it's a short story. Uh, I have other things that you can look at but the design was a big factor compared to its precursor, Wave 1. Of course, the, uh, the design led to uh, a better improvement in metallurgy. That wasn't available back in the earlier days, but uh, most companies now have some kind of heat treatment on their file, either pre-machining, post-machining, ours is post-machining, and finally the movement is everything. So we're the only file in the world that uses unequal bidirectional angles. It's not infringing on IP. And, uh, as you said earlier, it's one of the fastest grow. It is the fastest growing file in the world because it's perceived to be super simple. And with some of the technical things worked out behind the scenes, dentists don't really need to know all that. They oftentimes don't care not to be rude, but they just want to put the keys in the ignition and drive the car. They're not interested in what's under the hood. So, so these, just to um, clarify, those unequal angles will allow the file to like advance more passively and not you wouldn't you would have to use less pressure because you were saying when you it's you would have to push if it was equal angles exactly so when you change the the angles to make them unequal and i should probably do a little yell out to gasanya red so uh, pierre's the father of unequal angles gasanya red is the father of dialing in 150 30. Okay. And uh, you're, you're exactly right. If you have equal angles, you're going to push inward more and not manage your debris. But by changing the angles, you're continuously making circles like a rotational file. And that then is going to advance easier and also pull debris up more effectively, like a, a continuous rotation. Okay, well, that gives us a nice um, overview of the Wave 1 system and the concepts behind us behind it. Are you going to now show us how to shape a canal using Wave 1? Oh, I've been wanting to show them. Put the file to work. <laughs> you know, it's fun to make files, and you learn a lot about um, metallurgy, design, uh, rake angle, helical angle, cutting angle, tips, tapers, 
progressive tapers, increasing, decreasing. There's a lot to learn and I learned so much and it's influenced me as a teacher. So I have a lot of fun with it, but yeah, let's take them to the plastic block. Okay, before we get started with the shaping, one more comment about when you're done. I'm asked all over the world, when am I done? Uh, do I stop here? It says primary, you said take it to length, but what if I wanted to keep going? When do I stop? Look at your file when you take it out of the tube, and especially after you've reached the working length. And when you withdraw the file, look at its apical flutes. If they're loaded with debris, the file's telling you this file just cut its shape, your work is done. You now need to think about disinfection and on towards filling root canal systems, okay? So anyway, that's a little bit about how you know when you're done. And you have bigger files if you have bigger foramina, but look for the loaded flutes. That's what is a big distinction. Okay, let's go into this uh, block. I'm using a block because a lot of people use a tooth. A tooth is actually easier. A tooth, you can see nothing. You see the file go in the access cavity and you see the doctor pull it out on stage live demos, right? But you don't see when the file cuts, how it cuts, where it cuts. So I'm choosing a very tough model. This is actually much more difficult than a natural tooth. And if we look at this model, you can see that the canal ends actually right in here, okay? So anyway, if you draw a tangent line to the coronal part, and then we have our first curve, so we can draw a second line. And you can see we've got about 30 degree angle. So that's the first curve. And then if we draw a tangent line through the more apical curve relative to the first curve, you have another 35 degrees. So this thing is pretty tough. And we're gonna watch how a single file can move down, passively cut a shape, and give us a shape that could be 3D cleaned and filled. Okay, uh, I think you're ready to go. Ready to go? Ready to go. Always catheterize a canal. You know, I'm reading a lot in uh, different magazines and blogs and, uh, you know, videos online that we can maybe not even use files anymore. Please, come on. If you catheterize the canal, you're going to be assured that your shaping files can repeat after me. Follow. You want your shaping file to follow a glide path. So once you've catheterized the canal, let's go get a film. Let's use our electronic apex locators and we'll knock down the link. Everything's looking good. The next thing I want you to do is deliberately, intentionally move the instrument in short quarter to a half millimeter amplitude strokes and move the file back and forth until, say it out loud, loose. I want a loose 10 at length. A loose 10 is already almost a 15 file. So if you use the file at length until it's loose, it could be 10 strokes, it could be 100 strokes. The great clinicians that are listening know there isn't a trick. The trick is until it's loose. So now that you have working length and we have a patent canal apically, check the glide path. How do we know if we can use a mechanical file on this patient at this moment today? How we know is withdraw the file about a stop, slide it back in, withdraw two stops, three stops. If you can slip, slide, and glide over the apical one-third of that route, not only do you have a glide path, you own the glide path and instruments, mechanical files will follow. So you have a really nice setup now to bring it home. The block is coming along very nicely. Okay, this would be Goal Glider. You've heard of Pro Glider. This is a dedicated mechanical uh, pre-shaping file. I've written an article. You can go to the website and download it. But the international protocol for using mechanical shaping files is to have a 15 file or equivalent at length. So this is a 15 at the tip, but it's about twice as big as a 15 hand file. So I bring you good news and better news. The good news is heat treated, so it's not stiff like stainless steel 15. The better news is it's gonna make a hole, a pathway, a predefined pathway, significantly bigger than your 15 stainless steel hand file. That's really important. And you're gonna do it in an economy of time. 
So after we do work, we always know what? We always know what? We have an enormous amount of debris. So that debris has to be removed. We have to remove that debris, okay? And by removing that debris, I'm really talking about irrigating. So clear out the canal, and now we're ready to take on the primary. Not the small, not the medium, not the large. It's always primary. Primary, th there were uh, four clinicians. You saw their faces. But we did over 10,000 clinical cases, and we found out that in a referral-driven practice, over 85% of all teeth that came to our offices could be shaped with one single file. So when we talk about a single file, obviously sometimes it's a two file sequence because if the primary won't achieve length, you're gonna have to drop down to the small to finish the shape. Sometimes we call the small a bridge file because maybe the clinician prefers a little more deep shape and a little bigger apical diameter. So you can then get the small to length bridge back, take your primary to length, and you're finished. On the contrary, you might take the 25 to length, it's loose at length, there's no debris on the file, this would suggest to the doctor to move to the 35. Okay, so here we are with our primary. We have a bath of sodium hypochlorite, and we should be ready to roll. I want to really emphasize three passes. You know, I would travel a lot, and when I was in Dammam, Saudi Arabia, uh, I didn't emphasize the three passes and colleagues thought it was pretty easy. And so they just started pushing, pushing, pushing and we saw ledges. So let's work these files in and when they've done a little bit of work, think of third, scrotal, middle, apical, then let's take the file out, irrigate, recap with the tin and re-irrigate. Always fresh reagents. And as our shape improves, the reagents are beginning to penetrate laterally off the body of the canal. Second pass, you can brush a little bit to remove interferences, to work out into eccentricities off the rounder parts of canals. We can get better metal dentin contact by brushing into fins. So after every file, this is like endodynic religion, irrigate, recap with a tin, and re-irrigate. Vacuum, irrigate, vacuum. Notice that little bump right there. That was going to be removed in the third pass. Notice how it's smooth and flowing now. Look where the file loaded up. Did you see those apical flutes? Oh, if I was a little bit more clever here, I'd take you back and show you that apical part of that file was packed with debris. It just told Ruddle, the shape is done. I don't have to go to a bigger file. All right. Irrigate vacuum, irrigate vacuum. I'll have another episode and show you this 25 cent syringe can do something the literature says it can't do. I'll also give you a tip. All the literature says you can irrigate only one millimeter in front of the cannula. It's maximum depth of placement. I have shown for years that you can irrigate six, seven, eight millimeters apical to the placement of the cannula if you do a little vacuum irrigate. You bump your solutions, you get them to move back and forth, you get better cleaning. Cones slide into these shapes. This is a Nathan Lee cone sold by Densply Serona. Uh, tolerances are magnificent. They're going to go to length 99% of the time. And of course, when this cone slides to length, it confirms the shape. How do you know when you're through with shaping? Okay, so you might want to know, how do you know when you can pack? When you can fit the cone. How do you know you can fit the cone when you got the shape? How do you know you've got the shape when the last file is loaded with debris? So we have a nice shape, good cone fit. Notice we didn't transport, didn't zip, didn't rip. Have a few cases. Julian was one of the uh, co-inventors, London, England, on Harley Street, still doing, look at the recurvature. That MB is like swinging up and then that little uh, back, back to the mesial, back to the midline. That's world-class endodontics and it's the posterior abutment on a bridge. And Willie, I'm just showing you some cases from the developers, but notice the recurvature. Notice the shape is sufficient to allow for 3D irrigation and filling root canal systems. Hey, how about David Landwehr? This was the old wave one. This wasn't even gold. It's not very curved, so we could probably do that. But notice, hey, look at this. Notice this. Lesion, lesion, something up in here. At six months, notice all this bone regenerating and repairing and coming back in because David is filling root canal systems. So listen, the trifecta is shaping canals, clean in three dimensions and filling root canal systems. Wave one definitely gives you that opportunity. So what else? Well, we'll get to the next thing by just showing you that online there's some reference material. 
Uh, my daughter, who's with me constantly, she's, she's mainly the author of these articles. And on a piece of toilet paper, I use a little pencil. I jot down some bullet notes. I think one ply for each note. And then she assembles the notes and we have a roll of toilet paper and it becomes an article. So we have great graphics that you can refer back to, mainly what I just showed you. And then of course, around the world, we like to pass these out. These are laminated technique cards, but it basically shows you, you know, the step-by-step, -step, step one, step two, right to the very end. So we're proud of this, I'm proud of this, and you can download this for free. Well, I think our audience is probably wondering, considering you are inventor of both Pro Taper Gold and Wave One Gold, that what is your personal preference? What do you use? Well, as long as you're using one of them, I'm very pleased. <laughs> no, um, I'm asked that question, Lizette, all, all around the world. Everybody like thinks they're, they're gonna get me on this one. And here's how I always answer it, and I know this maybe sounds political, it's not, it's right from my heart. Everybody that I've noticed that's pretty good at something, they have their own self-discoveries. They, it's not teaching to say, here, I want you to use this. You're here today to train to do this. So when people came to Santa Barbara for decades and decades and decades, well, I said, let's get a mandibular molar. Why? Because the mandibular molar has an MB and an ML. The MB and the ML in a mandibular molar, the mesial root, they're going to have about the same length, about the same diameter, and about the same curvatures. So what we always did in the seminars is I said, do the MB with Pro Taper, do the ML with Wave 1 Gold. Zip, don't say a word, and they would all come up and proudly say, you know, I did several canals with both and I'm really liking this one. So it was funny who would like what. Uh, I probably prefer Pro Taper because I like to distribute the workout over maybe three files and I can have a little better tactile sense. Uh, the, 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 the Shaper 1, the Shaper 2 are just like a wet noodle. They'll snake into any glide path and progressively open up the shape. But I'll tell you, you go to a dental school, the kids love Wave 1 because it's one file most of the time. And universities that have to worry about infectious diseases, and I guess we'll have another segment on coronavirus, you told me. <laughs> but uh, we can go back to England and look at where the uh, the home of mad cow disease originated, I, I believe. And of course, the Minister of Health there demands that anything that goes below the orifice is used one time and thrown out. So they're encouraging patients to, uh, to know about this because they take out spot ads in prime time in the UK, three countries, and they say to the patient, did your doctor do this? And what they do is they show uh, an assistant, nice, she's cute, and she's dressed up in her little outfit, and she takes the file triumphantly from the sponge, the doctor's sponge, puts it in a bag and gives it to the, paper, the patient. And this is to say, did your doctor give you the file? So it says at the end of the segment, does your doctor do this? In other words, give you the file so you know they're not gonna be used on the next patient. So if you're talking about single use, one file is in intriguing. Cost-wise, if you think of a hospital where you might have 100 students going through, can you imagine sterilization and the thousands of patients that are being served and the, the instruments going through cassettes, through sterilization processes? So a lot of times it's just simpler. Uh, it is fast because you're not changing files. So it's a faster technique uh, because you're using typically one file. So who is it really intended for? Like, I mean, obviously, if you want to save money and throw away less files, because you only have one to throw away versus several, or, I, I mean, you said it was used in dental school, so it must be good for people who are learning, beginners, because of its simplicity. Are there cases, or are there canals where a wave one would be contraindicated? You know, those are good questions, and I'll probably say something that won't upset you, but it'll probably upset people out in the field, because I'm going to speak very bluntly. I love it when I start talking to a really highly trained endodontist and he'll say, well, you know, I'm looking at that preoperative film and then I went and looked at my CBCT scans and I thought, you know, uh, I'm going to use Vortex. The very next case, he's looking at his scans, he's looking at all of his imaging and he's going, Pro Taper. I never ever could make that distinction from a radiograph. A radiograph is a two-dimensional picture of a three-dimensional object. Pro Taper Gold will treat every case on planet Earth, and if it doesn't, it's because 
the apex is blown out with internal resorption, we have to use a barrier technique, blah, blah, blah. Wave one really doesn't have any restrictions either, because when you start to get bigger than a 45 diameter at length, you have to start thinking about blocking the foramen with MTA or some kind of a barrier technique or surgery or anything like that. So to me, uh, I know you're trying to push me into that box, but I really want everybody, and I'll look right into the camera, you should have your own discovery. Have a rep come out, show you both systems. You have the motor, have some teeth already opened, have them be mandibular molars. Try one in the MB, one system. Try the other system in the L. You'll know what to do. You won't have to tell me. Well, there's a quote I really like, and, and we used it at the end of the paper that you just showed. Um, it's by John, I, John, Nesbitt? John Nesbitt, and he's the author of Megatrends, which was a bestseller several years ago. And he says, we must learn to balance the material wonders of technology with the spiritual, spiritual demands of our human race. And it seems like wave one really takes into consideration um, the, the clinician and what the clinician wants. It seems like it's it's almost like you could say it's the file of the people. Very, very good. You know, I heard something. I sent you, you and Isaac a little uh, uh, clip from the internet. It was a TED Talk, mm -hmm. uh, Technology Entertainment Design, and the featured speaker uh, talked about why and what. So for me, my close would be people, uh, we, we think as uh, owners of something, we want to sell them this. This is a what. What, what do you want? You won't want the car. But people don't buy what's as much as they buy why. So the why is that spiritual part. People don't even know in a workshop. They sit down and they just go, wow. But they don't know about heat treatment. They don't know about the rake angle, the helical angle. And they don't care about all that because it's in tune with the harmony of just the focus of the clinical procedure. Well, that's great. Thank you for that presentation. I think we all learned a lot. Okay, so we'd like to close our segment today with something that we call Ruddle Flashback. And you may not know this, but my dad is actually a very good storyteller. So we'd like to have this be a recurring segment where he tells a little story, and usually it's funny or maybe has a lesson, but a little story from his past. And so today he's going to tell us a story, and why don't you tell us? Well, I don't know that I'm a storyteller, but... I guess because I'm 72, I have a lot of stories. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the story I have today, uh, hopefully we'll have a, a morale to the story or there'll be something that the audience can benefit from. Uh, it had to do with us relocating from the West Coast to the East Coast. I'd finished dental school in San Francisco and Phyllis had worked in the city and Phyllis had been a computer programmer, was, and had put us through dental school. So she said, if you want to go to grad school and be an endodontist. Uh, I got two little kids. I think you said you were... I was four, and four. I think Lori was three. Lori was three, so she said, I'm gonna be taking care of them and you're gonna need to work. So that meant to me, I was gonna need to take the Northeast Regional Boards so I would be licensed so I could practice in the evenings and on Saturdays. So we went to Boston about a month early and we all loaded in the car, and you remember the trip or parts of it, and uh, you were a good sport. Very big car, wasn't it? <laughs> that's going to be another Ruddle flashback okay, story. Okay, <laughs> that's another one. So we arrive in Boston, of course, I need to get patients. And in that era, dental schools were closed pretty much the month of August, but Boston University School of Goldman Graduate Dentistry was open. And so I went down there, they accepted me to come down and look for patients. So I hung out in oral diagnosis and treatment planning to find caries so I could do uh, a restoration. And then I needed to find a crown and bridge patient so I could do that. And I needed a denture patient. And that was the three parts of the practical board at, that was gonna be at Harvard on a Saturday. So, you know, I had my patients lined up except the denture. And I didn't have the denture patients, and I kept waiting and waiting for a denture patient, and there was none. And it was Thursday, and I was starting to panic because the next board would be in six months, and I need to get my license so I could start practicing as I went to grad school. So, anyway, finally, I, with panic, they said, call the chairman of removable, fixed, removable and fixed prosthodontics, 
at Boston University and he might be able to help you. And I didn't think that that guy would call this kid who wasn't even a licensed dentist in their state and would maybe help me, throw me a lifeline. So uh, I gave this secretary my number and sure enough that night he called me and he called me and he said he had good news and he had bad news and I said, well, what's the good news? And he said, well, he said, I got a patient for you and he said his name is Clem Daniels. He's a professional denture taker. He said he's done many boards before and I thought that would be really good news because all that experience. <laughs> That's odd that he's done it many times. He probably had a top dresser drawer that was full of dentures from all the previous boards. Anyway, I said, what's the bad news? He said he's a severe alcoholic, and he said he gags like nobody you've ever seen in your chair ever. He said he is a bona fide gag reflex guy. Because, you know, for a denture, we have to have the posterior flange of that denture go pretty bit much back towards the soft palate and ending... Uh, an imaginary line between the hard and the soft palate, and that's called the vibrating line. So that's where you extend a denture. So he, him and I were talking about that. He said, you might want to relieve it a little bit so that Clem doesn't uh, eject the denture. So sure enough, uh, we're, I got the impression I'm down the lab. I'm making dentures, and the radios are going. All the Everybody's riveted doing their job because we're all trying to finish by 5 p.m. So, you know, I get my denture made, I get all the teeth set, you know, and I get the articulation on the type of dot, and it's a thing of beauty. And I go in there and I ask the instructor, I said, I'm ready for a try-in, and he said, go ahead. And I said, I think I have it extended like you want it, but I think I should relieve it. He said, you guys from California, you're all the same. He said, give it to me. So I gave him the maxillary denture, and he said, clam open. So he jammed that thing in, and Clem threw his legs up, and I mean, every vein in his neck was distended and he got red and purple and that denture shot out of his mouth and no exaggeration, it cleared Clem's feet. <laughs> and it landed on a granite floor in the clinic and broke into three pieces. And I was like devastated. And it was like 4.15. So, uh, I had to get permission to leave the floor to go to the lab, so the same guy that, uh, participate in the event said yes you can go repair the denture so I sped to the lab and I uh, basically came back in uh, about 20-30 minutes later and I had the denture repaired and I uh, spoke to the instructor and I said I'm ready but this time he said relieve it relieve it to the fovea palatini and extend it out to the hamular notch I said okay so we did that and he said go ahead seat it notice he didn't seat it <laughs> <laughs> I seated it, and I got it in there, and Clem bit down, and it was a thing of beauty. He was relaxed, and the instructor came over and told me to stand back, and he went through all these nephrological moves that we have, work, balance, protrusion, all the different excursions that the mandible can do, and he finally said, okay, and so Clem was dismissed. When you went down to the lab, were you just panicked? Or like, I mean, what were you thinking? Well, fortunately that day I had worn a diaper in <laughs> anticipation if things can go wrong, they will. <laughs> you know, Tool has a corollary to Murphy's Law. He said that Murphy was an optimist. <laughs> well, to finish the story, I, I uh, got bolstered across my life, I think you do too. Uh, with quotes from famous people or no-name people because quotes are, uh, they can be embellished, they can be part of your lifestyle, they can take your mood to somewhere else, they can be uh, inspirational, they can be magical. So I'm known around the world as I have a lot of quotes and the one quote I'm going to say today that has to do with this denture story is from Giovanni Di Pietro Di Bernardoni and you might know him as Francis of Assisi. <laughs> That's it. Okay, so he had this famous quote, and he said, uh, th think of this in the context when things go wrong. He said, immediately start with what's necessary, then proceed with what's possible, and suddenly you're doing the impossible. So break this down like a football game. We'll break it down. So what was necessary immediately? Get the three pieces off the floor, less traffic. Somebody <laughs> stepped on and crushed the denture into a thousand pieces. So I got the denture off the floor. I got permission from the instructor so I didn't fail the exam to go back to the lab to do the repair. When I got to the lab, what was possible? Well, I had my cast that I still was, was perfect. I had repair materials, polymers. I had a grinding wheel so I could anatomically polish and smooth the denture. So 
basically in the process of doing what I could do, I at a quarter till five, I was running back with this little denture in my bucket and I was going back to the patient and then he saw me. I was kind of panicked because there wasn't a lot of people there. A lot of the docs that were taking the examination were gone. A lot of the examiners were gone. <laughs> but my guy was standing by Clem like a sentinel so anyway, I nodded, he nodded, and he said, you seated, and I seated, and I told you that part. So anyway, that quotation uh, is how I handle a lot of problems, because a lot of times things happen, and we're going, oh, why'd that happen to me, or I can't, can't believe it, it's impossible. Well, do what's necessary, then the possible, and suddenly you're doing the impossible. I think a lot of times, like when we're confronted with a project or even maybe a work day that's just really full, like you just get kind of overwhelmed, like, oh my gosh, I have so much to do. But when you just start on one thing at a time, eventually it starts to seem like, you know what, I'm getting this done, it's working now. Almost like when we decided we were going to do the Ruddle Show. I mean, like, where do you start? That's such a huge, overwhelming project, but then just one step at a time, and here we are. <laughs> well, maybe on another story, you'll tell the camera and all your friends out there a little bit how you managed yourself this morning during the whole set, and how you uh, pulled from a famous quote so we could get through the sound, the lighting, and all that. Well, anyway, I in closing, I would is. like to just say, you know what? You can't change the wind, but you can always change your sails. See and you, you can get time. to where you want to go. <laughs> See you next time on The Rebel Show.